Yeah, why not? Appreciate you, bro. Fire. Hope you're doing all right, Joycey. But, um, what's good? What's going on? What's new? My brother, I'm just, I'm good, man. I you good, you? We got over Thanksgiving, going into uh, Christmas now. I, I, love, I love the holiday season. Me too. I tell you, uh, bro, I, I just rest. Like, I'm resting. I ain't doing shit at work. Christmas is my best time of the year because I, I get to watch my own movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You shut your eye out. All shut that. your eye out, pal. <laughs> and, and we were talking about the other day, the Wet Bandits. Right. You know, Home Alone, classic. Macaulay Culkin had the, the so one leg up on them. You know what I'm saying? Triple C. Yo. How you feeling, bro? Maintaining and chilling, bro. Maintaining and chilling. Ladies and gentlemen, listen. Before we get into anything, and y'all, I got to uh, got to the booth tonight, and I heard a record that just drove me insane. Oh. I want to give a shout out to Conway. He got a new record that dropped out. What's it called, Triple C? Conway the Machine. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is amazing. Hey, yo, if you a fan of hip hop, listen to this song. Hey, yo, right this now. is real New York hip hop, bro. I haven't heard. I haven't heard bars and a beat like that. Thank you, Triple C. Listen, just just can't give him too God. much. Can't give him too much. Just a taste. <laughs> That's a little just a taste. taste. Yo, that right there. We don't want the authorities Fire. coming after us for that. Fire. Fire. Shout out to Conway. Hey yo, New York rap is back. Yo, I'm because up. Uh, I'm just no, you good. I'm just saying the current New York rappers ain't rapping like that. Mm -hmm. I say them Buffalo boys up there, man. They, Yo. they are spit. They holding the flag. Oh my, are they? Thank you. I mean, Thank shout you. Out, shout out to Davies, Jim Jones. No, yeah, yeah. Shout out, day. shout out the New York rappers, but, but they not right spitting here? like Conway. Not Griselda. <laughs> not right now. The, Yo, Griselda, that whole staff, yeah. Benny the Butcher, Conway different. That's yeah. all I gotta say. Out the Derringer and then the producer. Yo, for the kids, well, the kid got shot in the face. And yo, he's still Batman. You see his face is like numb to one side. It's like Two Face from Batman. But man. like he said, he's he. Oh my god, yo. Let's see, yo. All I gotta say, this record is a powerhouse. Anybody in New York, anybody in the world hate on this record, you a hater. I Certified. Got, like I'm wondering, like Funk Flex is playing it, like because if they're not playing it, then and listen, you're wrong. You need to drop a million bombs on that record. Period. I'm so happy hip hop is coming back to New York City. Yo. Ain't none of that. Right. Nah. Now, fuck. Oh, pardon me. Yeah. All that dancing. Nah. I, I'm, I'm, listen, I, I ain't hear bars like that in like two decades, bro. Shout out to Conway. Yo, my brother. Hard record. Pause. Hey, anybody that doesn't think that's the song of the year, you can hit us up. Matter of fact, go we kick rocks. <laughs> There's nothing to debate. I don't even want to hear your hating comment. You know, because I'm straight. Because right. I'm straight positive, baby. You heard? <laughs> Anywho. Anyway. All right, let's get into our spots. Cool. Triple C. Let me get that background. Gotcha. There we go, ladies and gentlemen. Stop box USA. Don't forget. Pick that up for your pistols, your handguns, your SBRs, your ARs. Whatever you got. They even got the shoddy now. They got the shoddy. Right, 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 right. They right, do right. have the shoddy. Moss. You know? Be safe. Be safe and cautious. Keep it away from your kids and your loved ones. Remember, don't forget that discount code, 20% off, all caps, Silverback Podcast. All caps, Silverback Podcast. We take care of you from your boys in blue. We appreciate you. Dre, what else we got? I'm going to go with on IG because this is a law enforcement thing. This is a first responder thing. Yes, it is. Blue Line Tattoos. Gave us a shout out. A shout out to them. No doubt. They, you know, if you're going and gorgeous and you do the first line thing. Right. And you got a little tattoo. Blue line tattoo. They'll take care of you. They'll take care of you. Listen, uh, you know what I'm saying? We, we might come through and get a little, little sun sun. You know what I'm saying? Stop. Add to the repertoire that I got. You know what I mean? But uh, peace and love to everybody. What else you got, Jay? After you get the tattoo, stop at Bond House. Yes, get yourself Bond a nice House. meal. Right, because we'll be there and get you a nice little quest song on the side. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Put a little butter on that thing. And then when you leave from there and you on the nightcap, stop at this shipyard pub. 
Right, get you a nice drink. And then that's it. And you go to your coach. By then you should be right, go home. You should be ready to go. Yeah. Word. Let me get a quick shout out to my brother JB. JB versus everybody. Follow his podcast. And um, everybody be well, be safe. And we ain't gonna waste no time. We're gonna get right into it. So, we got a special guest tonight. Every guest is special, but this one is real special, special. We're but, about to talk about something different. Word. Triple C play that in the background, baby. Yes, yes. The owner of Quantum of History. Also a fellow brother in blue. BPD detective. He's phenomenal. He's got a phenomenal body of work that he's going to discuss tonight. And uh, we love, we appreciate him. Dre, what else you got? I just want to say he also has a phenomenal body. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Thank yo. you. Hey, hey yo. mother, no, yo. No, but also a fellow podcaster. Absolutely. Yeah. But yo, let's get into it. My brother, Donnie, everybody. Oh, thank you so much, guys. Thanks for having me on. You guys came on my show, and you guys did it out of the bar. I got so much good reviews from you guys. So I really appreciate you coming on. The Silverback Club. My man. The kids are Silverback in the gym. <laughs> Word. I remember the first time I met you, before we even became partners, you were like, I started the uh, the CrossFit gym downstairs. You did. You did. And you, uh, you hit me up like, yo, come down. And you were like beasting it down there. And I was like, yo, who's this dude? Who's this dude? Now you, you, I mean, you was a phenomenal instructor on the CrossFit too. That's awesome. So I was like, yo, I got I to gotta go balls to the wall. Actually, Happy was the one that put us on. Shout out to Happy in New Jersey. Yeah. A good brother over there. He's the one that's like, yo, hit him up, hit him up. We worked out. It was dope. That's what's up. And then now we're partners. And now we're partners. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's dope. That's funny. That's funny. Right? That's crazy, awesome, bro. So, Donnie, what's up, man? Well, um, tell the world where you're from. Born and raised, bro. Uh, thanks again for having me on. I'm actually born and raised uh, in the Lake Placid. Say like New York, way upstate. Okay. Basically, like. 45 minutes from Montreal. Montreal. Bro, okay. you remember that movie with the big ass alligator, right? Yeah. In the lake? Remember that movie? Lake Placid? Yeah, you know, lake Placid, like, yeah. Like I said, we, we, we hosted the Olympics twice. Nice. <laughs> the Olympics. Right. We held That's the crazy. 1932 what? and 1980. We had the Miracle on Ice. Was in Lake Placid. Oh, you and everybody remember? Wow. That goddamn movie. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm saying. You know, I'm from Lake Placid. Somebody's like, oh, you got that big alligator, right? Nobody <laughs> <laughs> saw that movie right. in the theaters, but everyone's like, oh, yeah, yeah. That's, you got the big classic. alligator, right? Called classic. That's, That's crazy. Unbelievable. The Miracle on Ice. Right. The Miracle on Ice. Whatever. Yo, Lake Placid, <laughs> though. Right. That, that big ass alligator. alligator right. Right. Yeah, I ain't never yeah. going up there. That's it, right? You, you defeated the Russians in the best war moment of the Cold War, right? No, 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 no. We got the alligators. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> but yeah, that's a, that's where I grew up. And uh, and then I got hired with the U.S. Border Patrol and I moved to Las Cruces, New Mexico, and I was stationed at Deming, New Mexico. And there I spent four years there. And then uh, in, the, in, la, in te, la Tierra Encantada. And then uh, made myself over to Baltimore City. So it's been... Uh, how was your experience with, uh, you, where was you at in Mexico? You yeah, said, I, was, Patrol? I was in Deming, New Mexico. Nice. So basically, if, if you look at the, uh, the the geography of New Mexico, there's a boot hill, and there's nothing. There's nothing there. So that's where I was stationed. We would have, we, there were places that we'd go that you had to have 60 miles to even get a gas station. Wow. So we actually had to put governmental gas stations in uh, the desert so that we could actually get to our post because there's nothing there. And then you would get to your post, you go through drive, drive through, like, Miles and miles of dirt roads and shit like that um, to actually get to your post. Oh, wow. it, was, it was a whole different. It was a whole different world, man. It was a. It's, it's definitely the juxtaposition between two conflicting paradigms of border patrol and nothingness of New Mexico versus the uh, the lion's den that is Baltimore City. Mm. So, what made you want to leave? Man, it's not something to do. Yeah. Is that boy? Yeah. Oh my god. Four years is long enough. Four years is long enough. Four years was long enough. I, I, the work was a lot of fun. Like I said, you play hide and go seek for a living. You play with amazing toys. But we had these clear recons mm. that you could, you could, you'd hike. The, your whole job is hiking. Like when you're, and all. By the way, if there's any customs agents that claim that they're border patrol. Stop that. You wear, <laughs> you wear, you wear a blue. Stop saying you. You introduce yourself as a customs agent, please. 
So call yourself Border Patrol. You wear green, you're Border Patrol. Big difference. Big difference. The green okay. jumpsuit. The, mm -hmm. Yeah, the, yeah. The green, the green. You actually go hiking. You actually go catch people. You go arrest people. If you wear blue and you work in an airport, you stamp passports. Please don't put in terrorists. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Shots fired. Shots fired. I don't care. Shots I, don't fire. care. I oh. hear so many people would be like, oh yeah, exactly. I hear so many people like, oh my my friend's Border Patrol. Like, where does he work? Oh, Charlotte, North Carolina. There's no border at Short Carolina. You're a customs agent. Please stop. Please stop claiming Border Patrol. You can't claim it. You ain't Border Patrol. <laughs> Just like, look, I'm from upstate New York. I can't claim New York. I can't claim New York. It'd be like me from the woods of upstate New York being like, I'm from New York. How would you feel right now if you're like, oh, you know, you're from New York. I'm I ain't from there. That ain't New York. Well, because cause you know the first question, like, are oh, you from New York? Word. That's what's up. Well, what part? <laughs> exactly. And if I come say Lake Placid, you're going to say you're gay. Right. Like, oh, you from our state. Oh, you oh got no me. doubt. We have this, we have this uh, joke, too. Like, every time, anybody, if you're from, like, the city, the fiber, or whatever, you, you, where are you from? The Bronx. That ain't New York. Where are you from? I'm from, uh, I was actually born in the Empire State Building. That ain't New York. <laughs> <laughs> no matter where you're from in New York. It's that always going to be. That ain't New York. That ain't New York. <laughs> or because, I mean, we come across somebody from Brooklyn, I'll be like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, that that exactly. You, you voted for AOC. You but, that ain't New York. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but every time you come across somebody, it's like, they assume you're from Brooklyn. Because right. I guess Brooklyn is the most popular. No. Yeah, but we had stand up. Nah, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the whole borough, even Long Island's popping. Long Island's shout out to Long Island. Everywhere popping, bro. Shout out to them Far Rockaway. You know, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Jones Beach. You know what I'm saying? What's all the joint? Little uh, Bitties. All, all Jones Beach has yeah. my thoughts. Oh, Jones Beach. Beach. Mm. But anyway. Anyway. Yeah, let me digress and take a sip of this martini. Yeah, there you go. I'm a, you know what? I'm going to take a sip mm. with you. Shout out to CW Post. Word. Shout out to Stony Brook. All my sea wolves. What's good? <laughs> Long Island's a good time. A phenomenal time. Yo, All right, this, so this um, martini is a good time. It's Sorry. an amazing time, bro. So, what led you to Baltimore City, bro? Like, uh, out of coming from, um, what are you using, New Mexico? From Coming from the Gatorland down to New Mexico. And then when I, I, I was in New Mexico, I wanted to come back east. So, we moved to Albany. Why do you call it Gatorland? Because I have big gators in my oh. oh, classroom. Mm. <laughs> Stay with yeah. me. <laughs> I think it's, it's not a game. Mexico, game no. I think it's in New Mexico. Uh, no, it, there's nothing. Like it, it was, it was so great. Like even um, so, it never rains. It only rains for one week a year in New Mexico. And when it rains, it, 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 it the, the ground doesn't soak up any water. There are so many tarantulas that come up, like those big ass fucking spiders. Mm. That when you're driving down the road, you literally sound like speed buzzer. Ooh. Really? No it's way. Crunching over. Crunching over tarantulas. It's, it's a surreal. It's a surreal world down there. They're that big. Oh, oh, they're yeah, they're big. I mean, they're harmless, but they're they, I, they're big. That's not for me. So, <laughs> and, and there are. There was but, nothing out there, like. Nah. No. The, the first time, the first time you ever step on a rattlesnake, Oof. it fuckers your butthole. It Oof. is Oof. so. What? So. Right. <laughs> hey, sir. So I was. Thank you, Triple C. Yeah, you we used him? to. Uh, like I said, you have to walk in the desert. So you walk in the desert and you can't. Somebody's in your ear hole. Um, yeah, I mean, got another one. Yeah, I got one. Thank you. <laughs> so, anyways, you're getting punished in the ear hole and you're taking one of those. Jesus. Yeah, don't, yo, don't do that to that. Yo, he'll play this game one night. Don't do it. Don't do it. This guy will play the game. Um, so you have somebody, you have somebody walking you in and somebody's on the, the flare walking you into the group. And they'll just delay enough and you just have to sneak up on them and arrest them. Well, as you're going, you can't use a flashlight because it'll immediately. You can see a flashlight for 30 miles, 20 right. minutes, unless you use a red light, which you can then you can see. So you're walking in, and I, I remember the first time I was like, I knew Trey. I'm like, yeah, I can't wait to help him. Like, let's go. Huh? I'm like, you know, sneaky bond over here, uh, going in, sneaking in, and then out of nowhere, out of nowhere. What is that? That's, that's, the, that's the, the snake, the tail. Oh, that's the sound of a rattlesnake. Yeah. Yeah. You never forget. Shut up. I didn't. I didn't know what it would sound like in person. And then the first time you hear it, yo, when you I say, fought it. oh, you fought when it. I say I jumped six feet in the air, going, ah! <laughs> yo, I was fanning my face. I was done. I was like, no, yeah, I'm you, good. And you didn't oh, see good. it. And, well, I jumped up, but I'm like, <laughs> and then I I'd like have to walk back. I'm like a little real princess style. Because you don't know exactly where I it's no at. Yeah, because you don't have your flashlight out. 
you don't have your flashlight, right? If you, I have a flashlight, but you can't put it in because if you push the flashlight out, you, the group's going to see you. That's the what I'm saying. The so element of surprise is done. Yeah, you're done. It was done as soon as he screamed. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so after doing that for a while, um, I'd always... The reason I picked Baltimore was I moved to Albany for a little while, and I was going to do like a New York State Trooper thing. But when we were on I the was checkpoint, too, at one point, yeah, I mean, it was, it's and when you're in New York, it's, it's a well-paying job. And Absolutely, you know, it's, I thought it was, I thought it was very prestigious. Yeah, yeah it was. The estate trooper too. State in trooper in New York City. What? what? Also, um, New Jersey. Those guys. Facts. Well, New York, they started out state trooper. They started out with eighty grand. Yeah, that's walking through the door. Yeah, yeah. Wow. so I was like, sign me up. Yeah. with that gray, with that gray uniform. What? Gray and, and 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 the that stet- hat, that no, no, that Stetson. That Stetson. Uh, Stetson. Stetson. That shit could be bitch pink, and I'd have been wearing that motherfucker. <laughs> with precision, that you hear me? Yeah. What? <laughs> with the shoulder pads on for the shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I, I moved there and I was like, all right, well, maybe I'll do the state trooper route. And then I started applying and then I'd always, when I was growing up as a kid, my favorite show, weirdly as a growing up as a kid, was Homicide Life in the Street. It was my favorite show. Mm. My favorite character of any TV show I've ever seen is Frank Pembleton from uh, Homicide Life in the Street. And the way he did the interrogations, the way Baltimore portrayed the gritty, the, the dark, the depressing, I don't know, I don't know what the allure was. So I was like, damn, I want to work there. All from that show. All from that show. So I, I didn't have any kind of, um, I didn't know Baltimore other than Homicide Life in the Street. And like I said, my favorite character of all time is Frank Templeton mm-hmm. from uh, Homicide Life in the Street. So then um, we were down on um, a checkpoint one day working on Border Patrol. And sometimes you get detailed to a checkpoint where you're just on the road checking people's citizenship. It's boring as hell. And somebody had the application to look at people's scanning, like the, uh, the radio scanning or whatever. And they put it on the Chicago and Chicago was like, shots fired, shots fired, go, 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 go. Mm. And I'm sitting here bored as hell, sitting here at this checkpoint. I'm like, uh, that, that's, I want that. I want that city cop life. I want to know what that's like. I want to be entrenched in that. And I've done the desert thing, and I'm, I'm kind of done with this thing. I want a new challenge. And uh, hearing the radio, of, you know, shots fired, shots fired, go, 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 go. I'm like, damn, that, that's the high, piece, high speed stuff. That's what I want. Mm. And then I remember going through Baltimore, and then I visited Baltimore. I have a friend down here. And I was like, you know what? I'm applying. I'm applying here. This is where I want to go. This, this, this is it. I got my, I got my city life. I got my, my high speed. I got my Frank Pembleton. I got everything I want to do right in the city. So then I applied, and then like a month and a half later, uh, they told me, yo, you start, you start Monday. And I had two days to go get an apartment. Damn. At the academy. A month and a half. Yeah, a month and a half they took me. Yo, you gotta lock this shit up. This shit is. This shit is nice. <laughs> 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 they gave me three. Damn. Like I said, yo, my wife had proposed to me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, shit. Nice. <laughs> nice. Look at you, badass. That's it, yo. That's your stop. You don't leave this on the free agent market, yo. Right, at all. <laughs> don't even let it walk past you. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, so how much time you got on now with the city? Seven. Seven in April. Seven in April. That's what's up, bro. I did uh, the academy, and I did just about a year, almost a year. On and the street? I, on the str- on the patrol, and then I got into the robbery unit, and then the robbery unit morphed into drug unit, and then did the drug unit for years, and then uh, I got down to DDU and doing uh, robberies and dabbling in shootings here and there. Nice. It's been, uh, been fun. It's been, it's been a little ride. Yep. So was it everything you expected? And more. I, I can tell you that, um, yeah, I, and I kind of did this with my application. I recently talked to, listened to the application for law school, and I, and I talked about how, again, we've talked about the juxtaposition of paradigms that I've had. And then we've talked about living on the border and looking at what border crosses go through and what these people from Oaxaca or these people from Guatemala or what these people are coming through and the story that they have and you talk to them and how their journey is and what they're trying to do. And I've had that that sense of culture, that paradigm. And now I've gone into Baltimore. I have a completely different paradigm. I'm from upstate New York. It's almost like 95% white. We're very poor white. Mm-hmm. All right, so we're literally from the sticks. Almost everybody, you know, has a very blue collar job. There's no, I didn't know what wealth was until I was college. Mm-hmm. I had no idea what it looked like to be wealthy. And the first girlfriend I ever had from college um, was wealthy in this place in Lake George. And then I had another girlfriend after that was wealthy in Lake Island. That was the first time I ever exposed to wealth. 
I thought wealth was like making hundred fifty thousand dollars a what a year. Big difference. Big difference. I had no idea what it's like to have three homes and one is in New Hampshire. How about that? I had no idea until I yeah, until I had college. So until you start um, so, yeah, so I had that ASL. <laughs> that's it. This, right. this 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 dick has brought me places. Absolutely. <laughs> right. I've got to thank her father. That's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Where are we going this weekend, honey? <laughs> Pulling that hair. That's, that's Wherever that's you want to go. That's it. <laughs> the dick and the magic belt will bring you anywhere you want to go. How? <laughs> So, my, my, my man. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, so yeah. So I, I, the first time I actually experienced wealth was was Long Island. So I've lived in poor way. I've lived in poor Mexican, and in Baltimore, it brought me to the poor black, and it is a completely different. Remember the first time I walked into Baltimore, I could not believe how segregated it was. Mm. Just like it is, blacks here, line. Whites here. Mm -hmm. That's it. And I and I, you know, kind of been a, a, a lot of the country. Baltimore was never anything like I experienced as far as segregation. You go down the street, you are the only white person walking there. I've never experienced that before. It's a whole different paradigm. Mm. You go anywhere else, you're the only black person walking there. And then you look at what people go through and go through these projects and you live and you see how they live. It's not just reading it in a book. It's not just studying it or thinking about it or talking about it in a book or talking about it in a classroom or talking about it. You literally live and you see what these people live, live like. And it's a completely different awakening that you have. And Baltimore has given me that. Give, Baltimore has given me the chance to see what the third, you know, aspect of, of you know, the United States of America living is like. Right. Was it overwhelming for you at first? Uh, I don't know if it was overwhelming because I was so open to actually being part of this. And experiencing well, that, but when reality hit, you was like, "Wow, it's, it is was this way really what it is?" <laughs> it was way, yeah, it's way worse. And, it, and I try to explain people that that haven't that are from a different area, or from even like a fluent white people I know or fluent any kind of thing, to understand what it's like, to understand the culture, to understand the mindset, to understand what it's like to walk into these people's homes, and to to walk in and see one dirty mattress where two kids are sharing. It. Right. To walk into these houses and to see how this is, how life is, and how it's not just like, that's just how it is for the entire area, how the entire block, it's just a normalcy. Right. The fact that this, the living on a mattress has become normalized, I, I, you, you can't explain that. It's just, it's ineffable. Like, it's, it's just something that you cannot, you have to see for yourself and experience. And I, and I can't, I definitely cherish the fact that I have that experience and that I can draw on it. Right. And Baltimore has definitely given that to me because there's only how many cities in the in this in this country that can give you that kind of experience. There's only a handful. I was going to say absolutely. Detroit, St. Louis, New Orleans, right? Chicago, Chicago, but only a certain part of Chicago. Chicago is even more. Yeah, they're super wealthy up there. Yeah, I mean they. they I'm North side. I did a, a class. My entire class, one of one of my undergrad things is, is Chicago. How um, they gentrified it. And it, and how it is is just the high rises. Just the entire the entire class was all on how they organized Chicago and how Chicago is the reason it is today, because of decisions they made in the nineteen sixties. Mm. In the nineteen sixties, how about yeah. that? When LBJ came in, and uh, he just kind of and he dropped n bombs and he was a racist guy, but they kind of view him as not that. But when he came in there. Again, this this New Deal and all this other stuff that came in in the, um, I mean, it's just these sixties where you just put them into put all these um, poor people, put all the blacks into one area, and put them in high rises and call it the free housing and all that stuff. All it did was just set them back, you know. Wow. It's tough. But you get to see it. You get to see. It. I learned about that in a textbook ten years ago about what it was like, and then I moved to Baltimore. And I had a conversation with these guys in, I remember when I was on patrol, I did, I had this con a long conversation, like a two hour conversation with these guys from Douglas Holmes. And Douglas Holmes is, is one of the projects in, in Baltimore City. And I talked about, I, I will, you know, I said, I'll never know what it's like to be you. I never understand, you'll never understand what it's like to me. And I will never try to pretend like I know what it's like to be you. But you act like we're the bad guys. And I get it, the police are the people you see. But the, we are the enforcement, we are the reciprocation of things that have been decided by your government 40 years ago, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, when they put, when they built these projects, they're put in there for a reason. And, and it, and it sucks. And it's like, how do you get out of it? 
How right. do you get out of it when you live in a world that is all this? Right. That's, That's a beautiful point. Yeah. Damn the so fact that, like, you you know, don't get mad at us, you know, which was the enforcers of something that was decided before I was even been. I'd never been here, and it was already decided. Right. Yeah. And, and I think I, I think I struggle with my morality. At the same point as I've gotten more into Baltimore, and I've gotten when I did the drug unit for for a while, I think my own morality of being a police officer has been challenged in seeing that why the hell am I arresting a guy, a corner boy, sitting there dealing drugs when he's grown up and that's all he knows. Mm. And I, it, when I ha when I want to be a police officer, I want to be in law enforcement, I want to do these things. What is my objective? My objective is to help people, mm -hmm. to make life better. And I, I view that as the things that we view as automatically wrong. Murder, rape, robbery, theft. No, no one can, no human, human is going to discuss or try to um, say that those aren't the wrongs. But we start getting into the weeds when we talk about drug laws and enforcing the corner boys. And, and who, are, we making, are we making these communities better? Are we making them better by arresting a corner boy for slinging a 30-pack? Right. And that's the kind of morality I've been kind of, I've been faced kind of in Baltimore. I think is, 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 is the drug war worth it or who are we fading or, or what, what is, is the cost benefit analysis worth it? Is it worth it putting me this 19 year old kid who's dealing drugs in the corner and then he's probably has a kid by 19, he probably has one kid. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Here's the reality. He probably has at least one kid, one dude's mom. Now I'm putting him in for two, three years tops, like. You know, it's Baltimore, so you're probably getting a, you're probably getting a, a recon. But even if you go for two years for a drug offense, now you've missed that kid's first two years, and now you're still a kid of yourself. I, I don't know. Is 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 the cost benefit analysis worth it for what works in Baltimore City, versus what works in some place where like Harper County or, or some kind of like maybe you know does everything work for the same? And these these are the morality faces that I w these are questions that I would have in my own mind that I would not have been exposed to without being part of the city like Baltimore. Mm. Yeah. Now from, did you face a lot of adversity when you was on patrol? And how did that make you a better patrol officer? Um, I think it was person. See, I feel like I faced more adversity when I was in drug unit, okay. but I couldn't understand. Like when I was in patrol, like patrol is patrol. You wear the uniform, they kind of view you as whatever, you're here. Mm -hmm. um, I made relationships. I worked in uh, the O'Donnell Heights area. I worked a lot of, I talked to a lot of prostitutes, a lot of prostitutes like that. I make relationships with them mm -hmm. um, to get information and things like that. It wasn't until the, the drug unit that I really, when you put on the plain clothes, right. you, you become a knocker. Right. You become a knocker sometimes. Big difference. The difference. Big difference. You were yeah. a big difference. <laughs> they, they even made a song knocker. about me in O'Donnell Heights called The Blue Impala. The Blue Impala. The Blue Impala. Nice. Okay. The Blue Impala comes out. Okay. You know, that's it. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not whole song. Wow. Blue Impala. Blue Impala. Blue Impala. Blue Impala. You see that Blue Impala? It's game over. It's you game know? on. You know, Big D's coming. <laughs> 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 the Big Fine one's coming out. No, I'm saying. Um, but yeah, the Big Fine was another story I'll have to get into. Later. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, but I think that's when I first found the first barrier because immediately you, you come up you are automatically judged. You are something besides what your thoughts are. Because mm. I consider myself kind of uh, I, intrinsical. I, I think that I think about things. I think I, I, I don't just take things at face value. I think there are layers to everything. And if I come up to you and you approach me and we have a thing, I don't view you as layer, corner boy. I'm not that. And you shouldn't evaluate me as knocker, white, big white boy. Just want to lock me up. Just goon, you know, all right. that stuff. So I think there are layers to things, and I think that was the first time I felt like, no matter what I said, no matter what rationale I made, no matter what kind of rash, rationale or any kind of articulation that I could make about why I'm there, what I'm doing, my job, it didn't matter because I'm wearing, I'm white, I'm wearing a, a knocker uniform, and I'm in that blue impala, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much sense I make, it doesn't matter what I say, it's a whole big F you to me. Mm, I'm not going to listen to you. And that's it. I, it doesn't matter what comes out of my mouth. It's, it's all just noise. It's all just noise. It's noise fighting noise. Right. How's the ignorance, the ignorance side of Baltimore when you got to the job to actually see it for reality? Like, yo, are they really like this? No, it was another thing. I, and it's another thing that can't, 
it's hard to explain. Right. It's hard to explain when you try to the things that come out of people's mouths, and you're like, I can't even. I don't even know where to begin with trying to have a conversation with you because you're starting at a level that is so ignorant right. and so not based on fact that we can't have a conversation because you are you're starting at this level. Right. If you want to come up at a basis, and I'll have a conversation with you based on. All right, you tell me your grievances. I'll tell you mine, and then we'll meet and we'll find out some kind of ground. But in Baltimore, sometimes the conversation is so, um, so down, so low on a, such a, a level that you can't even understand mm. that I can't even start to have a conversation with you because you're starting at an ignorant level that I can't even, I'm not going to bring myself down to. Right. This is true. So that's challenging. And, you know, I guess it, it is tough to deal with that. And it's, it's crazy of the different hats that we have to wear. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, and trying to even build rapport from an ignorant level that's starting at 100. And it's like, wow, how am I going to meet this guy here or even bring him down if he's already red in the eyes and just wants to, you know, tear my head off? Yeah, I mean, that, that's we talk, we talk a lot about terrorism when you're talking about like the Mujahideen and trying to evaluate with like, a, um, you know, Palestine and, and Israel. One per one person wants okay. Spit that shit. Yeah, I, I want you. I want your head cut off. Okay. I want to cut your head off. And then the other person's like, I don't want. I don't want to die. How about I give you my hand? No, 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 no. I want you to die. Mm. Okay. What if I give you my arm? No, I want you to die. What if I give you a leg and an arm? No, I want your head. I want you to die. And it, you're having a, this conversation where there's no give and take. There's no. There's one level. There's emotion. There's ignorance. And I can't bring you to anything that where I can give you an intelligible uh, back and forth between facts, between ideas, between thoughts, between anything that we can have, between anything. You are starting at a point where you're a knocker, you're white, I want you to die, fuck you, get down out of my place. Mm. Whereas I'm parting and saying, yeah, I'm white, yeah, I'm a knocker, I have something that I'm trying to do, but you have your own thoughts and maybe we can come in the middle where I'm trying to maybe protect drug trade, drug prevent shooting, prevent, you know casualties all this other stuff you're coming at a point where fuck you i want you to my out of my hood you don't belong here you're white you're a knocker you're the blue and pilot get out of here and I, and I can't i can't make a place better and i can't help in the position that i've been given which is a police officer but you do have a lot of power right you have a lot of power you have a lot of power to change you have a lot of power to influence these people's lives and if you can't meet at some kind of place where i can talk to you what's the point mm -hmm. and if you want me to die i don't want to die yeah. I'll give you a leg, but I don't want to die. Right. And that's that's the way it is. A hundred percent the communication has been there's no communication anymore. There's something very similar when you said about the emotions and the fact and a great Maya spoke about that. And the fact that like they're just super emotional. Mm -hmm. I don't care what you are and you're showing up with the facts. And it's like the communication's not happening. Because it's just like what you said, it's just noise. That's it. It's just noise. And even when you even when with the fight with your significant other, when she's hyped up and yeah. it's all emotion coming at you, you can't yeah. talk her down. It's just all emotion. And it's the same thing in front of these dudes. It's all emotion. It's just raw emotion that's coming at you and there's no rationale to it. You can't argue with emotion because emotion's not rational. We can't we it's can't not rational. Yeah. We can't come in any kind of productive uh, mediation because you're just gonna come at me with emotion and emotion is just not gonna help anybody. No. Because, uh, yeah, a lot of people work off emotion. You can't make an emotional response because that would tear down everything you built in any given situation. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, you know, dealing with what we deal with out in the streets, ignorance is the only thing they know. Yeah. You know? And it, and you can't. In the minute you show emotion, it's over. It's over. It's over. You right. will never get it back. Oh. So you have to, you have to stay. <laughs> so they they have to come at you, barrage you, barrage you, barrage you. You have to stay right. cool, try to keep at it. The minute you show emotion, they got you, and boom, it's over. And it just devolves, and before you know it, you're suspended for four days. And everything's recorded. Right. <laughs> and now, yeah, you get beside you. So, like, in Stoicism, right? Oh, Ancient philosophy. No, for real. Like in, no, I'm yeah, listening. In it Greek, sounds Greek, no, no, yeah. in Stoicism, right? Okay. In Greek philosophy, shout out to Amor Fati. No, All but day. they said, right? Epictetus, uh, Marcus Aurelius, even Julius Caesar, they said that what they were presented with a heavy, heavy decision, right? Of taking someone's life or sending one to prison. They said that they never made a decision that moment because at that moment, your emotions into it that's what they would say 
let me sleep on it. Right. You know when people be like, oh, yeah. let me sleep on it. That came from the ancient Greek philosophers. They used to say, you know what, on a heavy, heavy, heavy decision, let me, you know, get my emotions out, let me sleep on it, and then tomorrow I could come back nice and calm. I'm fresh. I'm fresh. Yes. I took a shower. Mm -hmm. Maybe I got the poison out. I got a good night's rest. Yeah, exactly. that's what I'm right. saying. It's like you when know? you're thinking of a baby's decision, you got to jerk one off before you go on a date. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, exactly. You said it better than me. Yeah, those days are over. Yeah, I, said, I said you got to get the poison out. I got you. Yeah. <laughs> never, make, never make a decision pre-jerk off. No, you can't. That's yeah, this is going to be bad. You know, they, could, they could be rug burn. If, you, know, you don't want that. Even, you if, the, even if you're pulling rope. Like, <laughs> oh, my done. God. If, if you got a turtleneck, good luck. That's it. Just get it done. <laughs> Blanket lid on your shit. <laughs> <laughs> and if you still don't feel that way, then it's meant to be. It's meant to be. <laughs> yeah, they, they ride out with it. yeah, but you get the poison out, you make a decision, now you're more rational. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And now it works out for everybody. It does. But now, imagine, right, what I just said, or what we just spoke about. Yeah. We're making that decision in a split of a second. Absolutely. And Instantaneously. In our careers. Right. I don't have a moment, hey, you know what? He's pointing a gun at me. Let me go home. Let me take take it easy. I'll um, be back tomorrow. Same maybe, time, same channel. Let me rub no. one out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a I'm a little hot right now. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. Yeah, I'm I don't out. like what you're doing. There's a vacant right there. I'm going to rub one out real quick. Right. <laughs> I'm going to be back. All right. Well, after after, after I fired one out in this vacant, I'm going to see if shoot bullets. Because I'm going to shoot the club up in that vacant. Oh, that dead wood. I'm going to shoot that. All that. All that. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> but that's that's essentially what we're doing. But you know what? That's that's why we. Need. You know what? It's these split session, these split second decisions. I Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where we have, we don't have a chance to go take a nap and relax. And, you know, but that's why we train. That's why we train. Absolutely. So that the emotions are taken out of it. Yeah, but I, I think even like you, you're talking about the. Split seconds. Excuse me, why is she funny? Nice. Amazing. Oh my god. Yeah, we're real sexy. Even the, even not even considering the split second decision. What about the decisions that you guys have? And I'll ask you guys about the same thing. I I've had decisions on. We have a great amount of um, discrepancy, and you know what we're gonna. What we're going to choose to enforce and what you choose to enforce and when you are on patrol and especially in a city like baltimore there's there's crimes happening all the time you are so surrounded especially in your areas like the southwest or west baltimore you're surrounded by criminality right what is it that goes through your thought process about which um laws and which things that you would choose to enforce well, I think that's an individual thing yeah because on patrol you're kind of freelancing and you're open, it's like open season on what you want to investigate or what you want to arrest individuals for if you find. Mm -hmm. So you got to have an agenda on what you want to do. And I think patrol is perfect. It's it, Patrol is perfect for an officer to specialize in what they love to do. And that's when investigations come in. That's when doing drug, drug work comes in. That's when traffic comes in. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and you get to perfect your craft in doing all of these things that are available for you. Yeah. And the only thing that kind of um, keeps you busy is if you got a busy district, the calls. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when you're not busy, you can take your time and, and hone in on your skill set and, you know, do drug work, take your time, right. do car stops. Did you guys, traffic. did you ever feel at a time when you questioned, like, you, I, I, the reason I'm, not, I'm talking about this is because kind of, I'm seeing it a lot with the, uh, with COVID restrictions too. And I'm seeing, I just heard on the radio last night, somebody's all right, shut this down for COVID restrictions, right? Mm -hmm. Now you've got a restaurant in Baltimore who's been battered and bruised since 2015, since the riots. Right. They're barely struggling. They are trying to make their living. Absolutely. Right? Now you've got, because all these politicians and everything that goes on, they are powerless without us. They need us. Absolutely. You can, you can write any law you want. You can, I can sit here and make any mandate. Hogan can do anything. Brandon Scott can say whatever he wants, but it doesn't matter unless we do it, yeah. right? That's a phenomenal we, point. We have the power. As police officers and all across the nation, we have the, that power to choose. And we could just say, you know what? 
you're overstepping your bounds. You're not in any, any kind of framework of what America was founded on. So when you're sitting there and I, I, I find, have you ever had a, 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 a situation where you had to struggle with your morality in the fact that somebody or some law or something is mandating you to do something and you just wouldn't do it because basically I still have, I still have my, uh, my freedom of choice. As a police officer, you have so much power. You got so much discretion. Discretion. And that's exactly what it is. You have so much discretion. And our moral compass plays a huge part. Exactly. And in, at some point, some I, I find myself this time, especially with the COVID stuff. If I was on patrol and somebody told me to go shut a business down for COVID, I would have, I just couldn't do it. I, I just, there was things, I just couldn't do it. This guy is just trying to make a living. I don't know. I mean, that's that's the moral question that I see a lot of. Yeah, the waitresses, the, wait, the waiters, they're all trying to make a living. It's yeah, like, those hostesses. hey, you. Yeah, the hostess. Shout out to <laughs> <laughs> If she wants to get those bartender tips, <laughs> especially in Baltimore, there's so many. There's so you know, hello, how are you? All I want. <laughs> you don't get that server position for free. Yeah. Oh, there's yeah. a whole lot of restaurant managers like, trying to, uh, you know. Yeah. Hola, mommy. I need a window. What's That's up? It. That's it. I need a window. See what's up? Yeah. <laughs> Applebee's. <laughs> Applebee's. <laughs> That's your fault. You started this. <laughs> But, you know what I'm saying? Slip a little extra. I think that's um, it's the you know what? It ultimately it's dependent on that officer. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's it's. But you don't want to get into group think therapy where you're just like, well, this is it's such as cop up sometimes. You're like, well, this is what the brass is telling me because there's so many instances throughout history when people have gone along with that. And you know, you want to look at, I like I said, I do a lot of for I do a lot of these history things. And I study a lot for my podcast and. Um, I see a recurring themes in so many things, you know, like from everything from Mao Zedong in China to uh, Francois de Valier in Haiti mm -hmm. to Stalin to Hitler to all these other things to Mussolini. It's always that. All right, well, I mean, I was told to do this, and that's why I'm doing it. And and I get that too. And that's all about being a leader. Yeah. Some people aren't because there is brass that tell you to do something. And I hear another supervisor, like, for instance, I, this happened, I think, like, two years, a year, two years ago. Uh, I think I was detailed. And they had us, um, it was cold, it was around this time. It was cold, though. Yeah. Right? And we was down, it was downtown deployment. So, you know, with the businesses. But it was so cold. And a uh, commander, he was like, uh, I want everybody outside their cars, standing out in front of their cars. I mean, it's blistering cold. So a supervisor a sergeant got on air and he said, would you do it? I doubt you wouldn't. Ooh. Yeah. Cause you in your car cozy right now. Mm. So he made us, yo, everybody heard. We was like, Oh, like that's what's <laughs> up. Like that's a true leader. That's how yeah. you protect your people. Exactly. Because like, cause the commander, would you do it? You know, you wouldn't be standing out there blistering cold. Right. Cause it's not needed. So don't give out orders. You wouldn't follow. Right. Cause you can, you can still show, um, omnipresence inside your vehicle. A hundred percent. You saw a lot in the riots, I think, too. I oh, remember, absolutely. Oh, yeah. I remember there was this, we were stuck before the, the main day. We were down in the Inner Harbor, and this is the one right in front of Con um, right on Conway Street, right before the, uh, right in front of the stadiums. They started smashing all the cars and stuff. And there was a lieutenant who was sitting there, and I'm sitting there, and I, I only had, like, four months on the job. And you get single 13, they're smashing all cars, single smashing all cars. Come on, we need help. And this, and you just saw bitch, you saw bitch in the guy's eyes. Yeah. There's no other way to describe it. He has a he has a gold badge, but it was bitch in his eyes. Coward, absolutely. Gold Straight badge, but he wasn't a leader. No. So you, he's looking all around. He's looking all around. I'm like I'm sitting in the van. I'm fuming. Right, I'm far in. Guys, I hear him. Like, get the fuck out. Like, how you not about that action when it's time to get there? I'm sure his so, boxes were a little wet. Uh, and I understand. He probably pissed all over himself. Yeah, yeah, that's right, what man. it is. Like, Straight it, square. And he's still, it, I can understand, like, he's trying to play the politics of I got to protect Harbor East, but there's nobody there. There's no process is there. Everybody's calling for help, screaming help. So finally, I just got in, ran out of the, I ran out of the van. I go, are we fucking going or what? What are we doing? Come on. Right. And then for like two years, the Steve from the wagon guy still to this day goes, come on. <laughs> <laughs> still to this day. That's it. Like, sometimes. Yo, just make the executive decision. So yeah, what? Because he was ready to go. And that's it. I mean, just because you have a brass and just because you have that, sometimes it's just bitching your ass. 
It is. And, and they shouldn't even be in that position. I mean, there's a lot Leadership. of yeah, they, they hide behind that power. Yeah. yeah, they do. Until you come across like you always say a real one. You come like, across a real one, that, that's a game changer. Yeah, we've been in a couple of situations like that. And it's like, it takes a man. Very few hey, people hey. who have power earned it. Yeah. I oh, agree. say it. Why say that again? Ooh. Say that again. Very few people who have power have earned it. Absolutely. You know, you look at these wonders that are have LT in, you know, eight, nine years or sergeants in three, four years. You know you haven't done anything. Buff magicians. That's it. Like you, yeah. Phenomenal knee pad work. <laughs> I mean, in our previous... In our previous... <laughs> <laughs> and you, I, got the, you got from hostess to server What? <laughs> Immediately <laughs> Immediately What? We spoke about that in our previous episode We you know, a retired captain Yeah, Lonzo he Wallen it. He said it it's a, it's a difference between, you know, just having that title and then being a leader You're authorized to, to serve in that in that position But you, you know, you don't know how to lead but, It's a big difference Yeah, uh, but I think the same point We talked about it from police to lieutenants and above but I think even talking about some citizenry to police, we still have power in the same way. Uh, when we go into neighborhoods or we choose what we enforce, we choose what things, we have to look at our own morality about what we choose. And sometimes it may conflict with what um, we're told to do or what our, our things like, go over there, get, 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 give me numbers, give me numbers, give, do this, do this, that. Maybe it's not that. Maybe you just have to stand up as your own, even patrol, you have that same chance to be a leader. Absolutely. You have the badge. You have a lot. You have an enormous amount of power. Being that, you can take away somebody's freedom. You can write. You can write a piece of paper, and a judge signs it, and you can take a ram, smash somebody's door, hold them in their own living room, and search through their entire house. Absolutely. And that's a that's a lot of power. When you think about the gravity, of what it's like. And I remember the first time I started writing warrants. You start writing warrants because that's what you're supposed to do. That's what it is. That's the first time it's exciting. Right. And then you start writing them, and you start really executing them and seeing that. And yeah, you get results, and it's, it's a good feeling. But sometimes you're like, man, I, I maybe should have done maybe should have done a little more on this one. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should just let this one go because, shit, this is just this is just a sad house. You right. know what I mean? Right. Like, was it really worth it? Your morale comes. It plays. It plays into you. It does. I, I think that you have to still have you still have to humanize who you're who you're policing. And a lot of people don't realize that like the job that we do, mm -hmm. we're human beings. Like we feel for these people that we're serving. Yeah. And oh, it just yeah. so happens that like, you know, they have back to the beginning of the conversation, you know, we're speaking to them that all they hear is noise. Mm -hmm. They're not hearing that we're trying to help. Mm -hmm. Like we're saying, I'm trying to help you, but they don't see that. They just see the uniform. Yeah. Well, or they just see point, you're in their living room you got them in handcuffs, and, I, and I, I'm not trying to play devil's advocate a little bit, I guess, but you still have them in handcuffs in your own living room. So when you take that power, you, you have to really, you have to really understand the power that you've been given. Now you have to because, like for me, my morale never comes into play because I'm built one way. I took on this job to do it the way it's supposed to get done. Mm -hmm. So if I make an ex if I make an executive decision, I'm a honed in. I, I already know what I'm doing. And I'm stuck on it. I'm not going to go back and think, well, should I really have done that? Should I? No. Mm -hmm. Because if you start thinking like that, that's when you know you did something wrong. Yeah. And that's the problem. Mm -hmm. And that's okay to own up to it because, you know, it's okay to uh, take accountability for what you've done. Yeah. Right. If I messed up, let's not mess up. It happens. Yeah. Okay. Like, like, same thing. I, I feel like I, I stand by every war I've ever wrote. Absolutely. I, I stand by every arrest I've ever made. Me too. I stand by every arrest. There's nothing I regret nope. about that. Right. My implementation of the law that it's written, I have no qualms. I did everything to letter of law. I never had A, knew what B was, and then had C, and then just kind of gave wrote B in there even though I didn't have it. Right. right. And I've, I've seen that before too. It's, it, it, it doesn't happen all that often, but it does happen. I've had A, I've had B, I've got to C. Mm -hmm. I have no qualms about the morality that I've had and everything, every word I've ever written on this job I stand by. Absolutely. But at the same point, sometimes I have um, trepidation about the laws themselves and what my actual impact is. Mm. And I think that's, that's where I grapple sometimes is am I going... And I'm just, am I just beating a dead horse? Am I just beating a beaten person by going into these projects and hammering a quarter boy? Is that why you want to go to law school? 
No, I want to make a little law school to make money. I'm <laughs> <laughs> mad. What kind no, of law do you think I just about? Wanna, I want to do corporate law. Just you know, <laughs> I just want to work for Exxon Mobil and Club Baby Seals. <laughs> 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 like I've I've done I've done my time in public service. I mean, I wouldn't mind doing it, but I feel like. If I was to get into politics, that would be like a dream, maybe of doing congressman or something like that. But my dream profession would be to go to corporate law and then become a lobbyist and then kind of get into D.C. and kind of have some kind of influence based on that. That would be my, my dream. That would be dope. Kind of go through those steps. Uh, Do you think law enforcement has prepared you for that? Yeah. I, like, as, as I said before, like, I've seen, I grew up in poor white, I worked in poor Mexican, and now I've grown up in poor black. And... Um, I've kind of seen it firsthand. I didn't read it in a book. I didn't just kind of skate through. I really entrenched myself. And when I was in Border Patrol, um, there were years I made the most arrests of the entire station. In Baltimore, I've been entrenched. I have really good closure rate. I have really good staff with the narcotics. I've really been entrenched in everything I've done. So I feel like I've, I've been rewarded for how much I've given in with personal enrichment and, and again, experiencing things. I love experiences. Whether it be, you know, Baltimore, whether it be New Mexico, whether it would be Hostess, you know, it's just all about experiences, you know. That's dumb. Your life's body of works prepared you for this portion in your life that you want to go on and do something else. Yeah. And I think that's amazing. Yeah, son of the wardrobe again. <laughs> or a big deal, of course. I, I, you ever seen uh, Debbie no, Moore and Striptease? Yeah. Absolutely. I'd, yeah, I'd be the Senator Burt Reynolds. <laughs> 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 Shout out to him. Man. He <laughs> rest in peace. That's it, yeah. Burn around those names. Rest in peace. Absolutely. Let me be your bag, man. You're good. Wow. Yeah. yeah, I think that you're seeing a lot. I see a lot of, at the same point, I see a lot of these politicians and I, I see a lot of things with um, balancing like critical race theory and critical theory and conflict theory and what you see in these paradigms and how it just uh, it just would not work for this, for this country. How does it work for anybody? You look at what BLM movement has done. BLM movement has basically taken Marxism and uh, the teachings of Karl Marx and have just rebranded it as yep. instead of being class warfare, which is what socialism is. Class warfare is we have to blame the proletariat and then or we have to blame the bourgeois for everything that's happened. And then what it is now is that we have to blame classes. And you just said just class warfare. It's now just race warfare. Mm. And, uh, you know, you just see it in these politicians before. They haven't lived it. They haven't been in it. They haven't, they, they haven't seen what we've seen. Mm -hmm. They haven't seen what these, what these actual conditions are. You just read it in a book. It's so different. And I always, call, I always say that communism and socialism is such a seductive circle. Right. Because you're basically saying that, uh, hey, you know what? It's not your fault. It's not your fault. You know what it is? It's their fault. You haven't been given, you haven't given, you haven't been given access. You've been put in these projects. You've been forced to live this way. It's not your fault. It's their fault. It's how much you can swallow. That's it. <laughs> oh, my God. It's not your fault. It's the fault. You have a, ga you have a gag reflex. <laughs> and then he adds to it. How about that? That's it. You, there's, a, there's a limit, sweetheart. <laughs> I'd love to bring you on, but you, you know, joke too much. <laughs> <laughs> This body, this body of work is not for you, my love. That's it's it. Okay. That's it. Tanner down the road, maybe you can take him, but this one, absolutely, you ain't taking this one. Yeah, it's long too much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Don't play in the kiddie pool, baby. So, mm. That's it. You know that's what I'm saying? <laughs> Don't dive in the deep end if you're if right. You're for the There's a shark weight over here, baby. <laughs> Put your arm floaties on and go see Daddy. Absolutely. <laughs> Triple C. Are you on? Triple C, come on. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> nah, that's, oh, that's amazing. What a great. All right, so, so uh, damn, seven years already, huh? Yeah. It's flown, it really has flown by. I it swear. It has flown by. Because I'm coming up, yeah, me and Dre coming up on our 10th. And I swear, it's like... Yeah, it's incomplete. Yeah. Tell you, it's, oh, man. I just... I don't know where the time has gone. And, you know, that that, that saying is, is you know, time flies by when you're having fun. Because I, I just remember on patrol and having so much fun there and the chemistry, the rapport we had with our squad. 
and just the district in total with command. It was a big family. And it's like, you know, you go to different units within the, the department. And, you know, for me being an instructor, and, you know, just so much experience I gained from that to what I'm doing now, it's uh, time is going by, man. It's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. And, and I think that it's, it's, it's amazing how much... We talked about this the other day, and that the decisions in the last five, six years, none of them have been for crime fighting. When you look at every, def and it's been nationwide, you've been in the department, no decision that's been made by politicians, by brass, by anything, has been in the, in the hopes of making the community better, or making um, community safer, or the fact that you're trying to fight law enforcement. It's all been um, accountability, 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 Officers, this schedules, all this other stuff. Everything seems like it's been anti the people who are on the ground. And how do you? How, I asked this question to you when you were on my on my podcast. How do you sell this job anymore? I mean, how do you sell this job? You know, I sell it because when you do the job that's supposed to be done the right way, community policing is easy. It makes your job easier. Building that rapport with the public, you know, wherever, wherever, wherever you, wherever your, uh, your district is, mm -hmm. getting out there, you know, it's it. The job is still fun. People is it? Love it. I love it. Yeah, I love it because I guess I love it because I don't let politics affect my vision. Yeah, you know, yeah. Un unfortunately, politics affects a lot of people, and I get it because politics is it's not a fun game to play mm. at all. Because at the end of the day, somebody's going to get hurt. Somebody's not going to like it. And, and an executive decision is going to be made. Now, you can either ride with it or get off, you know, get off it and keep it moving. But I don't let politics bother me or cloud my vision because I know what I'm here for. And I know what this job has done for me, what this career has done for me, and what I love doing. So that's why it doesn't bother me at all. Because with anything, there's rules and politics it plays a, a huge point with it. Mm -hmm. So you know it's it's for some people and it, and it's not for them. But even the ones that bitch and complain they ain't going nowhere. They still gonna yeah. be there. Yeah, the, I, I mean, with the, about a year ago, two years ago, I used to be all gung ho. Like, what are you talking about? Like, why are you bitching? First of all, you're making almost a hundred grand with overtime, all this other stuff, and your ass is so dumb that you couldn't you could not make this anywhere else. You you, right. you should be thank you. You're literally signing up for overtime. And you're sitting there. And putting, you're sitting in a car with with emblems on it and making overtime. You need to stop bitching about it. Right. And and it, there, there's been a point where I, I feel like with the overtime being cut, at least I could make uh, money and I could at least do my job. I feel like at this point in investigations, what they've done is you know by taking away the overtime, by taking away all the things that we could do, um, freedom of schedule, freedom of everything else, they they are really just hammering us down. Um, my ambition and my desire to do the job that I love doing. I love being a detective. I love doing investigations. I love doing all that stuff. It has really cramped my uh, morale to right. a point where almost paralysis has happened in my own um, career. And, mm. and it's sad to me because I, I was I was a really good detective. Still, I mean, I, mean, I still am, but I was way better last year than I am this year because... I have no overtime. I have no chance to investigate my crimes. I have no freedom. I, I'm just getting crushed. You think it's, take, it's taking its toll on you? It has taken its toll, definitely on my morale. And I, before, I, I would ride with you last year. Same thing. Like, stop your bitching. Like, what are you doing? What You can still do this job. You can still have a fun. There are parameters that are set that probably have been, should have been set for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I feel like they, they've gone on the pendulum have gone so far the other way. That it's gotten to the point where I'm like, I don't even know how I can justify. I'm, I, I'd love to be rah rah. I'd love to be, you know, yeah, do the job, do the job. I love the job. Now the pendulum's gone so far, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm getting beaten. I'm just beaten down at this point. Yeah. Do you think you, uh, going to another unit would, would would help? Well, I, I again, I had the same question. Like, so I got offered a couple of units, and I turned them down because the schedule was terrible. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, like, what? E even if I had, we had a same thing. Somebody was offered whatever unit you want to go to, and they were asked, you know, what what, you, what unit would you want? What's your dream unit? And I'm thinking here, I'm like, I don't even know. 
and, and that's a sad feeling for me to have mm-hmm. with a department and being a police officer it's a sad feeling that i'm like i don't even know where i aspire to because the units that i used to want to do like you know homicide stuff like that who wants that schedule who wants to live that life you know what i mean like who wants to live that life like, uh, like unless, I mean, he has a point unless you never want to see your family again then absolutely absolutely oh what else what is what is the dream unit now that i want to go to and in every single unit that i think about has a caveat of schedule treated worse called in all these other things like i don't mind working i, I work my ass off i don't mind the work hard work is what i've been built on mm-hmm. but it has to come with some kind of something and what it, i'm just that that's a sad part of my career that i've come to in, in this kind of crossroads that i've come to in my career is that it's sad that i don't even have anything to look forward to i don't have any unit i want to go to because they all have they all are shit at this point you know there's only I just want to do RMS work from nine to five, but then you're doing paperwork. But doing the actual job, if you want to do it, it comes with the caveat of they keep crushing you, they keep asking you to schedule, they keep doing, they take away the overtime arbitrarily. Um, I just I don't see the reward for going after these these high end these higher end positions when I got to sacrifice the other things. And at the same point, I have other interests besides being a police officer. Absolutely, and that's not what tell anybody to you know. Have something else. Have other endeavors. You definitely have to have something have else. To. You know, you got to have other outlets. I, you know, I look at the standpoint as when we came in. Of course, you get on patrol. You know when you're punching in, you just don't know when you're punching out. Yeah. So I always look at things like that. I always thought that was amazing. Yeah. Or, or my brother Dre. I Dre, love that. Dre always told me. <laughs> Because Dre's been in a couple units. He always told me, when I first left, got out of patrol, he said, bro, always pack light. Because you never know how long you're going to be there. Mm-hmm. And it's okay. So I don't let nothing bother me. Yeah. And I'm going to always pack light to whatever unit I go to. Nothing is guaranteed. You could be there for a week. Guess what? You got to go back on patrol. Mm-hmm. So I don't, I just, you know, I don't let none of that bother me. Because I know police work and I love to do it. So if others around me, that's why I got such, you know, great energy. Because mm-hmm. I love when I go out and I affect people. That does that does the service for me when I actually go out there and I talk to people on the street. Talking to them, letting them know, listen, stop doing what you're doing. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Give them a brief bio about myself. And then you, when you bridge that gap together, that's when all this is paramount. That's what makes it worth it for me doing the job. You can't control what's going to happen at the department. There's assholes there. There's just like there's assholes with any job. Mm-hmm. Whatever this is, they beg, I'm not going to let that affect me because I'm still going to... My personality, I'm always going to have fun. Regardless mm-hmm. of any situation, I'm going to have fun and we're going to make some money. So, some way, shape, or form, listen, we work in the city. There's money everywhere. Everywhere. To be made. Well, that, that, that's my problem is that there's no more money in investigation. No, nah, I feel you. That's you might I mean, have to that's, branch I mean, out, baby. I haven't... We... I mean, I haven't had overtime in... You might need a baseball game. You know what I'm saying? You might have to do uh, some secondary, baby. We're going to we're gonna have to work some baseball games. You know what I'm saying? Put, put the blues back on. I'm going to always come Look, back. Like I said, this, this, go, dick go. Is, this dick has brought me places. It's time for this dick to make some It's because he's, he's, he's fancy, bro. He bougie now. He's yeah, yeah. fancy. You know, he wear the satin drawers and shit. You know what I'm saying? He don't, make, <laughs> he don't wear the old crime fighters, yeah, though, boy. They, they don't make Tom Ford uniforms anymore, you know? Salvatore Ferragamo, you know, you know. Yeah, but see, but that's me. I like I love to put on my blues and go back and work some overtime. That yeah. don't bother me. It don't bother me. That's easy. Yeah. Easy eight hour, ten hour nut. Okay, let's get it. It don't bother me, but for, because I've been in investigations for so long, I have to get into a different mindset. No, the mindset you gotta get because once you put them blues on, I no. I'm, I'm 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 out of my comfy spot. <laughs> Shout out to every patrol officer across this country. Man. Word. We you love you. I bro. don't want to do. Yo, we <laughs> love you because yo. You're the backbone of every department. Yes. Yeah, especially the the uh, patrol officers that I got 15, 16, 20 years in patrol. Super facts. Yo. Yo, you you guys are masters. I would eat my gun. The, what, what's that little <laughs> yogi that everybody puts on uh, Instagram? The little, the real wise one. Uh, Yoda? Yoda, Yoda, Yoda. <laughs> those, those dudes are the Yoda. 
Not seriously. I'm pretty sure you said Yogi. You know what I mean? This is Yogi. Yo, I did say Yogi. Yogi the Bear. I don't, you know, I don't know. We so saw good. Look at anybody with you. Be a love. No, he's a Yoda man. Word. My brother, brother P. My brother Angelo. You know? Every district has a Yoda master. For every, like, young guy that, like, gets there, find that Yoda. Yeah. He's I mean, going to punch you on. Why was this guy Richburg? Why? Man, why was this guy Richburg? It's Richburg. 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 I would have never made it to my first year of patrol if it wasn't for this guy Richburg. Uh, no way. Is he retired? Yeah, he's retired. Oh, he's already retired. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't even know. That, that's another thing. Like, there's, there's, there's very few Yoda left. No, no, and that's sad. Yeah. It is sad. That's it's sad, like, bro. Like people who have been there, who would know and lead you the right way. It knows the ins and outs to everything. Like, we we got lucky in the Northeast. There were so many. Right. Big time. Yeah. Many. Like, Walter. they still there. And, and Dosin. Yeah. Chandler, who, you know, made us the piece. He will grab you up and be like, yo, this is how we This go. is what it is. Yeah, man. It was it was amazing in the Northeast. This, they still there. Adams. Tavon, yeah, Tavon, yeah, Tavon, Tavon what? He but but you know him. what? He's bringing that love Yo, that we Sar- built to the Southern District. On the low, Sergeant Lee, admin. Facts. She, when she was a patrol officer, she was a report writing beast. Yeah. 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 If you're listening, Sergeant, Sergeant Lee. Sergeant Lee. <laughs> But no, no it's, it's, that's, what it <laughs> that's what it is. It's, no, that's what it is. But at the end the, 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 so if, if Sergeant Lee was listening, she'd be laughing anyways. Yeah, she don't laugh. But I'm, I'm, she know what it is. Yeah. But um, I got a question for you. So I remember you asked us, who are we? Leave everything for as okay. far as a female, mm-hmm. okay? And in now, in the bond, universe. just and 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 the bond in the movie. So, like, what's the question? So the question was, what is it? My question to you, well, ladies and gentlemen, when Donnie, when we did our interview with him, with, with the phenomenal podcast, and what is it, Donnie? Shout it out. Quantum of history. Quantum of history. It's all about James Bond, 007, top shit. Watches, uh, suits, yeah. suits, everything. <laughs> Down it's to the socks. It's right. a history channel based on Bond movies. So if you are into history, if you're into historical topics, if you're into the rise of Mao Zedong, if you're into the communist regime of Francois de Valier of Haiti, if you're into understanding how a pipeline got from Azerbaijan to Turkey, if you're into all the intricacies of Middle East politics, if you're into all the intricacies of communist politics, socialism, all this stuff, listen to Quantum of History, I swear to God, it's the best co- podcast, second to only Silver Back Chronicles. Oh Amazing. my God! Amazing! I wasn't expecting that. Yes, sir. So, yes. And I don't think he asked us a woman that you would leave, leave everything for, take her Right off to the sunset. But it was a woman from a James Bond movie. Right. I gave it some thought. I had a couple. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I had a couple. Now, my... I got to give two. But I'm going to give one from James Bond and the other from a different movie. Mm. Okay. Now, another one. The first one was uh, Monica Belushi. Mm. Italian. Mm. Italian. Yes. We'll, 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 we'll post that on the uh, IG so that people right. know what Monica. But my my second one? Yeah. Kate Beckinsale. Kate Beckinsale? Amazing. You, know, when, you ever yeah. see Underworld, bro? Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. She's yeah. phenomenal. Even in what happened yeah, to her? She was insanely fire. She's still, she's still hot as shit. She started banging. She's, she banged she's got the young boys. Years. Yeah, yeah she's, she's bugging. She's a cougar now. Oh, right. Right. I ain't afraid. You know, get, was get it, it. Pete Davidson, she was banging for a while, and then... Yo, how does Pete Davidson keep getting these kids? <laughs> I have no idea, bro. Get it. I don't. I feel like I they like funny Ariana guys. Grande. Yo, Ariana Grande must be fire too. Yeah, she got oh, that yeah, good she, she she makes people like she make got angry songs. She got. Her. She listen. made Mac Miller just end it. Like you know. <laughs> listen, <laughs> Jesus Christ, rest yes. in peace, Mac Miller. Mm, yeah. It's all about that snatch. That's yeah, it. Yes. Like that's that it. must be crazy. Mac Miller, shit was, is... Mac Miller was like, I had Ariana Grande. Now I've got. You know, yeah, that shit, go. that shit like, must be what it is. There's nothing water. like I've reached, <laughs> I've reached where I needed to reach. That's it. Triple C, who you like in, in the James Bonds movie? Who you like? I'm real basic, you know. I'm, I love Holly. Oh, oh. yes, yep. 
He stole my answer. <laughs> <laughs> Who you like, bro? He stole my answer. Well, e e even if it was a James Bond, nah. who would you give it all for? Seriously? No, we, we, we talking fantasy world, so not reality. But Somebody who would you give it like, like yes. Back then or right now or no, anything? Right, right now. So right, right now. now. I'm police work. Police work is, it ain't for you. But this, 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 when I pussy, Oh, my you. God. Oh, my God. So, she, she said, come, come, I'm not gonna lie come, come, come on home with daddy. Oh, I mean, it. mommy. Hola, hola, man. That's time. Oh, oh, wow. Oh, really? Wow. I'm sorry. Right Are now. Are you serious? Look, look at look at right here. Look at all these you have to pick from. All right. All right? And you're going to pick from Meg the Stallion. No, I don't Meg know. Meg the Stallion, you can I, go to I, Hustler Club and pick. No, I like, <laughs> I like her music. Meg the Stallion is anything you can find in any. I like her yeah. music. No, is is Sophia no, Loren? There's no and all the women. No, no, but listen, if, women, if we're talking, no, I mean, no yeah. disrespect to her at all. Nah, nah, nah I'm just but, saying. You said right now, but out of the Bond movies, is Sophia Loren was she a Bond girl? No. Damn, there's one that looks like her. If you if you show me her, I know exactly who she is. I like this little Asian one. Was it Y uh, Y Len? Michelle Leo. Yes. Fire. You know what? I like the joint. Like Cindy Lou too. Like Zenya on the top. Oh my god. Who's the joint that Zenia was Zenya on the top will have sex. The, the whole point of Zenya on the top is she kills you by having sex with you and then killing you with her thoughts. Ah. Um, yeah. Oh, who's that? Which one's that one? Zenya on the top. Funk with Jensen. I yeah. remember that scene. Look, look at this. Head. Look at. Oh my god. He's like that person. The actress. Oh. Eunice Grayson. Nice. Look at these. Tatiana so, Romanova. There was one with black hair. Is that her? Martine Beswick. Well, Martin Baswick is. is, is, is mm -hmm. She looks similar to the Sophia Loren. Who's the one that looks like Sophia Loren? I don't. I don't know who's talking about. Eva Green. Oh, you're talking about Eva Green. Oh, I'm I know, sorry. I know I'm exactly. Who, I know exactly who you're talking about. You're talking about um, Catalina Marina. Can Can you show me up, please? Because I'm thinking about the uh, Frank Sinatra movie. Yeah. Okay. Sophia Loren was with him. Greatest name ever. And Audrey Hepburn. Oh, yeah. yes. I mean, how did you mess with it? What, what's her name again? Uh, Catalina Marina. The Cat Snatcher. Catarina Moreno. We're looking at we're looking at all the chicks bond to the sea. Twisted out. So who would you choose, bro? Who would you yeah, give it all up for? Yeah, who you Canada want to disappear? Oh, right now, like right, right now. now, right now. Take my badge. Take my gun. Take it all. That's it. You can after I have sex with you, you can take my dick. Like that's it. <laughs> wow, wow. <laughs> Trophy. That's it. She's that good. <laughs> And the Armas, and then uh, second one probably would be Honor, Honor Blackman. Well, that's a different right there. Third one, in, I that think third one, third one Oh, look at that hair. Oh, oh my ah, God. Who is, ah. who is that? What's her name? Is it close? Katharina Marina. Oh, um, what is she? Where's she from? She Besides being a goddess, oh where's she God. from? So that scene right there, she goes, Is it close? And I'm like, Oh. <laughs> oh, that's her. Yeah, yeah I saw you, yo. Yeah. 